BC is very proud to host him. Um, so advertising this um, lecture, many people ask me, what is green energy technology? You will hear it from the father of green energy technology, well, Kati. Um, if you look at his resume, you will also see that he's considered to be one of the most influential scientists in molecular imaging in the world. Um, and please read his resume. It, 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 we can't believe what it is. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Marlene, uh, Robert. And also, I don't know how I can fulfill the expectations here. Raise the bar so high. <laughs> well, uh, what I will do over uh, the next 45-50 uh, minutes, uh, uh, go through uh, some of the developments that uh, we are, uh, you know, unraveling uh, on our campus. Uh, specifically in the area of nanotechnology uh, and in particular as it relates to application of uh, the principles of uh, nanotechnology and nanoscience for medicine. Uh, this is, as uh, all of you know, uh, there's a lot of hype about uh, nanotechnology as it is with any new field, uh, but we are all scientists, so we really embrace realism rather than get excited about hype. So I want to present to you uh, some of the uh, you know prospects and promises that uh, this field uh, is uh, uh, providing all of us as uh, the field itself evolves in, in spectacular uh, directions in in, in, uh, in various applications, not just for medicine, but but for uh, in the area of uh, telecommunications, in the renewable energy, uh, in, in uh, several aspects of medicine, as well as agriculture. Uh, environment restoration. So this is uh, this is the field. So if an institution or an industry or, or a nation or a state is going to embracing nanotechnology, uh, it is going to be a, a huge loss. So uh, we better be in the bandwagon rather than trying to catch up. So this is the uh, this is an exciting uh, time. So it's it's important that we we uh, embrace this uh, in all its uh, uh, in all its endeavors. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to. Okay. Um, this is a slide I use. Uh, I love this slide because uh, as you look at uh, varieties of different uh, parts we have here, I'll go one by one. Uh, these are used on a day to day basis in hospitals all across the globe. If you go to uh, your, your hospitals in, in, uh, in the Western Cape or in your neighboring areas, they are using uh, Ceratec uh, for imaging uh, brain. And, and, and if, you, if you look at uh, patients being treated for one of the most excruciating forms of human cancer, which is bone cancer, and they're using Quadramat for treating patients with bone cancer. And for patients with uh, liver tumors, hepatic tumors, they use a product called Herospiel. And we'll talk about this these two, uh, in a moment. So when I say these three products, very often what lingers in the minds of people is that maybe these products may not come from Harvard or MIT or Caltech. Sure, Harvard, MIT, uh, Caltech, and related institutions have produced uh, a number of you know, uh, intermediate number of chemical compounds which are formed the basis for drug discovery. But these products are from us. Our department, my, my institution has developed all of these three products. And that's very relevant in the kind of discussions I'm having here during my uh, week stay here. Uh, my university is no different than uh, University of Western Cape. So we're not Harvard or Caltech. So you don't have to be Harvard or Caltech to be able to do some fantastic research to be able to do a uh, discovery program, to be able to, be able to uh, develop drugs that treat uh, humans all across the globe. All it takes is, is proper mindset, all it takes is institutional support, all it takes is, is uh, investment from the government and having the right kind of research tools. So you can do it here, okay? So that's the that's message, I'm, I'm very serious that you all, all of you uh, will take it and very soon you will start developing products that we in the U.S. 
or in Europe or in Asia, uh, people in Asia can use it. So these are the products from my department and they, uh, there, was, there was a lot to talk about these developments. So these are uh, products, they all have their own intellectual property, they all have their independent patents, and the patent revenue from these products pays salaries for a number of faculties. The patent revenue pays investment for future research so that we can continue to develop newer products. So MU Gold is a favorite name my university came up with, uh, University of Missouri Gold. Uh, this is a, a, a gold compound I discovered back in 2005. It's not a nanoparticle. It's a chemical compound of gold uh, that is uh, showing a lot of promise in treating uh, prostatic uh, breast and, and uh, hepatic tumors. So we will uh, hope we'll begin uh, phase one clinical trials pretty soon. And the area that I'm going to focus today is this uh, application of uh, nanotechnology for uh, medical applications. And, and, and the reason how we transition into nanotechnology is shown here on this slide. It is the Terasphere product, which is a microsphere. It's not a nanoparticle. Microspheres are much larger than nanoparticles. Microspheres are of the order of uh, 250 to 500 microns, you know, fairly large. But these the glass microspheres are embedded with atrium isotope, which is a beta emitter, and it's a product that we use for treating hepatic tumors by simply uh, uh, embedding these glass microspheres within the hepatic region. And it does wonder, sector. There are not that many treatment modalities for treating patients with hepatic tumors. And this particular product uh, does shrink the tumor, does control the tumor. So, in all our experience, a struggle with all these pharmaceuticals has been that we were not able to have enough of the dose within the tumors. We would have desired to have optimal dose within the tumor size, whether it is a brain imaging agent or the bone cancer agent or even the test agent. Okay. So, it is this thought. It is, it is this unmet clinical need, which is oncologists all across the globe, they are always struggling to have enough of the drug within the tumor site. How do you do it? So that is when we, we thought might be the nanoparticles, maybe the nanoparticles, maybe it is the, the nanotechnology that can come to our rescue. So just around that time, when we were thinking about applying nanotechnology to medicine, within the United States, National Institute of Health, which is uh, the largest public <coughs> agency that funds the health related research. They're thinking exactly, exactly the same thing. So as they say, you got to be in the right place at the right amount of time. So we were indeed uh, thinking exactly around the same time as the largest funding agency was thinking about. So I did uh, make a major application, uh, you know, incorporating several faculty, several of my colleagues, and then we succeeded, and they, uh, they helped me establish one of the only 12 cancer nanotechnology platforms all across the nation. So it is this platform that basically spawned all our activity, and some of those results I'm going to discuss later today. So that might happen to this nation. So it's, it's, it's important that uh, the, the, the institutional leaders, state leaders, uh, you know, really invest resources in nanotechnology, not just for research, but for education. So I've been teaching, I see several of the cases here. Uh, so it's, it's important that we don't keep advanced research away from education. Advanced research must coexist with higher education. So there's no such thing that I, I, I teach from uh, you know uh, one to four, and then I don't do research. So you, you've got to apply some of the research principles into what you teach. Okay, we do that all the time. So, the focus, again, uh, of course, there are many, many debilitating diseases. We have unmet clinical needs in, in, in uh, treating arthritis, uh, in Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, AIDS, a number of diseases. But cancer continues to kill more human lives. It continues to destroy more human lives year after year compared to all other diseases put together. So this is a major burden. This is this continues to be a major problem. If you look at the statistics of number of deaths back in 1950s, 1956, all the way to 2003, we haven't made a whole lot of progress. 
we still continue to see as many deaths, despite all the sophistications, despite all the investments. So this is still an unmetronical need. So this is where again we are, we are hoping that nanotechnology might come to rescue, not just on its own, but in combination with, with, with the collaborations in genomics, uh, collaborations with, with, uh, uh, with, with other scientists. So that's, that's the thing actually. So this is a, a very daunting statistics as you can see here. We continue to see uh, lives uh, being lost. Uh, as, we, as, we, as I uh, speak here, uh, several thousands of cancer patients <coughs> are dying all across the world. So what does it cost us? It costs us tremendously actually. So I look at uh, the 2008 numbers tell us that uh, 895 billion dollars were spent, which is uh, close to 1.5 percent of the world's gross domestic product, just on one disease. Uh, 2012 numbers exceed one trillion dollars. This is a lot of money. So no wonder people have started calling this disease as the economic killer. So there's a lot of work that we need to do. So this cannot happen just by chemists or biologists or physicists or our, uh, genomics people, it is a combined effort. And it is that combined effort that culminates in terms of using nanotechnology for disease detection and disease therapy. In the context of cancer, it is for early detection of cancers and, and, and then uh, employing therapeutic modalities. So it is early detection. Early detection is important because, because if we can detect glioblastoma, pancreatic cancers, breast tumors, or prostate cancers at the cellular level, well before the cells have multiplied and, and, and have transformed themselves into tissues, if we can detect the disease at the cellular level, we have therapeutic modalities. We can control the disease. We can, we can uh, stop the disease, and that's possible. But we do not have tools to, uh, to detect the disease at the cellular level. So that's why, so I, I gave you an answer before asking you that question. Why are we talking about nanotechnology now for medical applications? We are talking about nanoscience for medical sciences because every nanoparticle, each nanoparticle, whether it's gold or silver or magnesium or molybdenum or cadmium, it doesn't matter. Based on its size, we can calculate the number of atoms on the surface. If it's a, a gold nanoparticle of say like 25 nanometers, the laws of physics will, 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 will tell us how many nanoparticles we have on the surface. Okay, so we have 100,000 atoms or 200,000 atoms based on the size. So now I want all of you to think about if each of the atoms that you have on the surface, if each of the atoms were to contribute either to the diagnostic or the therapeutic payload, then you have. 100,000 times the power for either the diagnosis or for therapy. In other words, you have achieved an amplification to the factor of 200,000 based on the number of atoms. Now, there is, there is more simple maths to, to, to be done here. When we are trying to apply nanoparticles for disease detection or disease therapy, we are not going to be using just you know, one nanoparticle. We'll be using hundreds of thousands of nanoparticles. We'll be using billions of nanoparticles <coughs> in one injection. That's the power of compacting these nanoparticles. Which means the order of amplification that a clinician might get, either for disease detection or for therapy, is so huge that traditional diagnostic modalities or therapeutic modalities, they, they simply can't come anywhere close to the power of nanoparticles. It is that amplification that has excited all the leaders globally. It is, it is the exact same amplification that we see in telecommunication devices, in, in our ability to, to store data. So it is the same principle. All we are trying to do here is to harness the power of nanotechnology for medical applications. Well, uh, we uh, just to give you a, a quick uh, overview of what's going on on my campus, uh, we are not just uh, focusing on prostate. We are looking at application of nanotechnology for pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, uh, lung cancers. We're also using uh, nanotechnology, nanoparticles for gene and drug delivery. Uh, we are also addressing an important disease that affects all of us, whether we get cancer or not. Uh, thank God, every, everyone of us will learn something from cancer. 
but there is not escape from age-related macular degeneracy, which is uh, the disease that affects our eyes, because it's age-dependent. As we get older, we will begin to suffer from this disease, and this does lead to permanent blindness. So we're we are trying to look at if engineered nanoparticles can be used for therapeutic uh, intervention for treating this disease. This is, I call it, is the holy grail. And when we are talking about using nanoparticles, how do you use them? We would like to use them in ways that the doctor can localize these nanoparticles only around the tumor site, sparing normal cells. Okay, it might sound like a wishful thinking, but we can give sense of direction to nanoparticles. That's the whole business. That's the whole idea, because the nanoparticles are so potent, so potent that if they are anywhere in close proximity to normal cells, they will destroy normal cells. So that's something we would like to avoid or, or perhaps completely eliminate. We want to maximize the therapeutic or the diagnostic payload only around the tumor site, and we do that through principles of biotechnology. I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. This is a historic slide. This is how we, we started our work in nanotechnology. Uh, we uh, we made our first set of nanoparticles uh, back in uh, yeah much earlier uh, somewhere around 2005 2006 uh, yeah this is a this is our first paper in fact uh, if you if you look at uh, our progression uh, of how we have made uh, developments in uh, in uh, applying nanotechnology to medicine this is our first paper published in small uh, we use this peptide, it's also popularly referred to as caddy peptide, not because it produces nanoparticles. Uh, this peptide has other uh, applications. This peptide is actually used in treating Wilson's disease. It's a whole different uh, chapter, a whole different topic. Those interested uh, you know, in, in uh, knowing more about this, I'm, you know, I'm more, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me after the lecture. But now, the point is, we use this peptide because this has that unique ability to reduce or convert gold salt into gold nanoparticles. What it does, it, when it reduces, the peptide itself gets oxidized. When it gets oxidized, it chops off these bonds, so you get the byproducts of the alanine and phosphoric acid. As you can see, both these byproducts are bicarbonate. Phosphoric acid is something that we all consume every day if you're drinking uh, a Coke. Uh, by compatible alanine is naturally uh, available and acid, so there's no need to separate the byproducts. The whole process is biocompatible because we use this interesting looking protein, we call it as gum arabic, and it is uh, an extract uh, from acacia trees. I, I wrote prevalent in Egypt because I think this slide I borrowed from a lecture I gave in Egypt, but I'm sure acacia trees are there in South Africa. Uh, they are available in Everton's in South Africa too. Most of the tropical and the temperate uh, weather. And gum arabic, for those of you uh, who are hearing gum arabic for the first time, I can guarantee you that uh, you're using gum arabic every day. If you uh, have uh, enjoyed a candy uh, or an ice cream or a chocolate, or if you have uh, taken soup uh, this afternoon, or you have taken gum arabic. It is there in, in a, you know, as a food additive in, in yogurt and whatnot. This is the FDA approved. And it has a very interesting combination of structure uh, incorporating carbohydrates and glycoprotein. We like this complexity of the structure because we wanted a protein that can encapsulate around these gold nanoparticles in ways that the particles become not only in vitro stable, but our intent was to produce these particles as, as in vivo stable entities. You could do that without the arabic. People have been using thiols. All mercaptor compounds, sulfur, sulfur groups bind to gold. But our intent was to produce particles that are biocompatible. Because, because the whole objective here is to be able to use these nanoparticles inside the body, either for disease detection and therapy. That's why way early in the game itself, we embrace the concept of green, we embrace the concept of green nanotechnology. So this is uh, one of our first examples of producing these particles. And we quickly looked at if the particles are stable or not. See, some of my, my results, which uh, we continue to publish in high impact journals and whatnot, you will soon find out, oh my goodness, this, this is advanced research, but uh, much of it is all undergraduate experiments. 
Absolutely. So why not advanced research be as simple as undergraduates can do it in the lab? That's the way it should be. There's nothing complicated. So here's an example. So we produce those nanoparticles and we encapsulated them with gamma ray. Then we wanted to test. Are they stable? Very simple test. You take 5-10% solution uh, of sodium chloride, mix that solution with these gonadal particles. If these particles are unstable, they become larger. They get agglomerated, like the way you see with the citrate nanoparticles, which is popularly used everywhere. Citrate nanoparticles are good, uh, are not good for biomedical applications because they get agglomerated. So we have a lot of saline in the blood, the, you know, a lot of sodium chloride sort of features within our system. So if they are injected into the human body, they get agglomerated. That means that the very property for which you are trying to use it in the body gets defeated. Whereas the gamma ray coated nanoparticles, you can use 5, 10, 45 percent solutions of sodium chloride. Nothing happens to those nanoparticles and those nanoparticles are deep. And that's again the power of this something that's readily available uh, from, from nature. We can use it for uh, developing nanoparticles for, uh, for biomedical use. Uh, we did some, some quick tests. We injected the, those nanoparticles into mice and then analyzed all the body parts of mice, from small intestine, large intestine, blood, bone, the brain, and heart. And, and the mice species showed about 85% of the injected dose was going directly to the liver. Okay, so we did a series of experiments. Then, then we, we got this idea. Hepatic, patients with hepatic tumors, actually they don't have very many detection methods right now. Uh, ionated contrast stations which are used for X-ray imaging all across the world, they, you cannot image the hepatic region because iodine gets washed off very fast from the liver. Well, on the one hand, it's a good news because you don't have too much of iodine accumulation when, when you're, you're subjected to X-ray imaging. Okay. But the bad news is if the whole idea is to image the liver, you don't have the medications. So then we thought that because these nanoparticles, without doing much, are localizing within the hepatic region, we thought we might use these nanoparticles for hepatic imaging. That's exactly what uh, seems to be happening. Uh, this is the image of the uh, pig, uh, sorry, uh, this is the liver uh, image of uh, a pig, uh, pre-injection. And this is after injecting these nanoparticles coated with gamma ray. As you can see here, the contrast is quite clear. In this image, you can see fine structures of blood vessels. We haven't injected a whole lot. We have injected 47 milligrams uh, of gold per kg of body weight. This is considerably less, significantly less compared to how much one has to inject, the one has to be made using iodine. Human patients are injected up to half a kilogram, close to 750 ml of highly dense iodinated agent into the system. Doctors won't tell you. I'm from radiology, so that, that's what uh, is injected. So it, 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 it's a problem. So we may have an alternative with significantly lower doses of gold. We see much better images. And supposing there is a submicron size hepatic tumor, with this image, a radiologist will be able to diagnose the patient for the presence of that from some disease. So we can see a quick transition from a simple experiment at the bench level going all the way to the bed level. So likewise, where, where there are more scans, you can see uh, a slightly better contrast of, of the same uh, similar image. And then even smaller regions, you know, portal vein uh, or uh, vena cava, you can see a really nice, nice contrast with these uh, nanoparticles. So uh, at this stage, what I will do is I will switch gears a little bit. I would like to talk about another unmet clinical need in medicine. We don't have very many therapeutic modalities right now for treating patients with solid tumors. Solid tumors manifest through varieties of tumors, head and neck cancer, oral cancer, prostatic cancer, lumpy breast cancer, sometimes even osteosarcoma, which is a very fast growing tumor, grows like a, like a solid tumor. So currently used chemo agents, which include doxorubicin, or cisplatin, they, they fail to penetrate the tumor component <clears throat> that they're solid tumor. So if the doctor tries to give more of these doses, the doctor 
in most instances will kill the patient out of the toxicity of the drug rather than the disease itself. So that's a real unmetal for me. How do we handle, how do we address these patients who have solid tumors and these patients, they, they cannot be surgically resected. You can't take out the tumors that, that easily. <coughs> the tumors could have a strong attachment to uh, the sensitive glands, sensitive nerves. So there are many, many instances. Uh, within the prostate uh, tumor population itself, over 35% of prostate tumor patients cannot be surgically resected. You cannot remove the lumpy prostate uh, tumor tissue by surgical resection. So they, 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 are, they are left uh, untreated right now. Okay. Head and neck cancer, exactly the same reason. You can't surgically resect head and neck uh, tumor patients. So that's an unmet clinical need. So we are trying to see if we can use nanotechnology uh, to address that. So for prostate tumor patients, I was telling uh, our students this morning the story. Uh, if a patient uh, is, is uh, diagnosed with prostatic tumor, urologist will implant these uh, radioactive seeds. These are stainless steel seeds. They are radioactivity uh, encapsulated into these seeds. These are very large seeds. They are about 50 to 500 microns, very large in size. They, they cannot, they do not penetrate tumor <coughs> because the tumor porosity or the tumor vasculature gives you, provides you only about 300 nanometers. So the porosity of the tumor is not more than three to 400 nanometers. Whereas these seeds are 500 microns, order of magnitude larger, larger than what one might be able to penetrate. <coughs> so implantation is heterogeneous. And after implanting, there's no guarantee that these seeds will reside where they're supposed to be. They tend to migrate to other regions of the body. They go to the lungs. They go to the heart. If they go to those organs, they, they irradiate those organs. So you'll see considerable radiation damage throughout the body. Okay, so again, a big problem. So the question is, could we inject something directly into the <coughs> solid tumor so that the drug permeates, distributes evenly? And if that drug can control the tumor, then you can shrink the prostate tumor volume considerably so that the patient is free from this disease. Right now, we don't have that also. Right now, we don't have anything that can be directly injected. The only thing we have to address this highly heterogeneous disease is through heterogeneous implantation, which is which is not a good thing. It is not a good thing, and we know for the fact because it leads to numerous toxic side effects. So if you talk to any of your relatives or friends who have gone through breakage therapy, that's uh, that uh, type of therapy where seeds are implanted is called a break therapy, you will see numerous toxic side effects. Okay, so rather than comforting the lives of patients, they are put to tremendous order of discomfort all the time. So again, there are, there are major, major developments needed here to address this problem. And we are looking at uh, nanotechnology might be one way. Uh, again, this is a, a apology for the complexity of the slide. But the intent uh, of this slide was to show you varieties of things that go nanoparticles are capable of doing. I'm not trying to uh, you know, tell you one must be, one should be using only gold. You, you know, one can use other types of metals, but, but gold is unique because of its properties. Gold can be used in X-ray therapy. It can be used in X-ray imaging. It can be used in photoacoustic imaging, optical coherence tomography. And if you switch from non-radioactive, normal gold to radioactive gold, you would certainly enter into radiotherapy. Uh, a, a tremendous, uh, you know, avenue for us to treat not just the prostate tumor, varieties of other tumors. So I will show you how we can produce radioactive gold and how we can convert radioactive gold into radioactive nanoparticles to develop inherently therapeutic uh, nano domains for for treating varieties of cancers. So, ask uh, my students uh, yesterday, what do you need if you want to apply? Nanotechnology to medicine, what do you need? So, I, I really confused. Okay. So, if you don't have nanoparticles, you, you, you won't be able to make any progress. And what are the ways you can produce nanoparticles? You can produce nanoparticles by varieties of means. You can use toxic chemicals. You can use for, for gold nanotechnology, for example, we use 
interaction of uh, gold salts, gold precursors with sodium borohydride. Instantly, you produce nanoparticles. You can use hydrazine, you produce particles almost instantly. But then you need to worry what might happen to the toxic waste that is there in, in the flask, the toxic uh, boron compounds or the toxic hydrazine compounds. How, how can you separate them? We are dealing chemical reactions here at the nanoscale. We don't have that luxury of filtering something, identify something. We don't have that luxury here. We don't have that luxury of purifying the products. So, which means that we have to go back to the drawing table and think about establishing or setting up reactions that may leave minimal or no toxic waste. Ideally, we would like to have reactions that have no toxic qualities right from the beginning. We call it as a life cycle analysis. You want to worry about the toxic chemical that you have started with. You want to worry about the toxic chemical that remains behind unreacted. You want to worry about the byproducts once you have produced your nanoparticles. So the entire life cycle analysis is important. If you ignore it, you're injecting toxic chemicals along with the drug into the body. We don't want to do that. So that's where we have uh, basically embraced green nanotechnology approaches. This is a big, big market, not because it's just applied to medicine, because it's uh, applicable to energy, hybrid materials, information technology, uh, environmental restoration, alternate energy, and, and so many uh, different fields. So the medical aspect is exciting for us because we can actually use what is there in the nature. The nature provides us with host of phytochemicals. If you just analyze what you have in, in, in your cup of tea, I'm sure which uh, all of you, may majority of you have enjoyed this morning. If you really look at what you have been consuming, you have been consuming a very complicated spectrum of phytochemicals that are there in tea. The good news is every single one of these phytochemicals, whether you knew it or not, is useful to your body. So if you are drinking one cup of tea, drink two cups of tea. Okay? So, uh, what is that one particular chemical that interests us as nanotechnologists is, is this chemical, epigallocarotin galactate, among other things. It's because this particular chemical is so unique that that single chemical alone can convert gold precursors into gold nanoparticles. So, we are really talking about using drinking tea to produce nanoparticles. Sounds like a fairy tale. So this is exactly what, what uh, we have done and, and it has been replicated all across the globe now. Before we did that, we learned some, some basic principles. I didn't jump to the idea of tea right away. In fact, my research in green nanotechnology started with this, five years. And the connectivity between nanotechnology and, 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 uh, and soybean was very simple, at least for me, because we tell our kids in the U.S. there is a lot more soybean consumption than it is in, in South Africa. So we take soybeans because soybeans gives you what is a mixture of antioxidants, which are good for the body. So for a chemist, antioxidant is equivalent to a reducing agent. So anything that is an antioxidant is a reducing agent. So for physicists, I have explained in a slightly different way, antioxidants, they, they grab electrons. Uh, or, or, or they, they, they grab free radicals. So it's all the same. So physicists define reducing agents in, in ways uh, that the chemist can understand. But the other way around is generally not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so because of the antioxidants, we treated the soybeans with sodium tetrachloride right? and in water. Just a simple reaction. That's what if there are no other chemicals involved, we produced coronal particles. Okay. So it takes time. You can expedite the reaction by, 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 by uh, various different means, uh, by heating and, and other means. But uh, if you wait 24 hours, you get uh, particles. If you want to scale up to 5 kilograms of gold salt, you can still do it. So it's, it's, uh, it's applicable at the bench scales as well as at, at, uh, at industrial scales. And we got a lot of uh, notoriety out of this uh, science editor chose to cite this in the editor's choice uh, and uh, for the place where I come from. We are one of the largest soybean growing states. Uh, our farmers were excited.
because they can connect their agricultural economy with nanotechnology. Okay, there's a, there's a lot here. Uh, we are not just preaching to the world. If you are trying to use gold nanoparticles for medicine, use fire beams. That's not the intent. My intent is, 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 is global, which is if you are trying to use gold nanoparticles either for your automotive industry, telecommunication industry, environmental restoration, name it, use the green soap cycle because you save the environment, you get what you need, uh, so that it helps everybody. So in that context, uh, Missouri economy really got a, 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 a facelift because uh, we grow so much soil in our state. Uh, uh, some basic principles here, nanotechnology, green nanotechnology is not just soybeans or tea. Uh, cinnamon has cinnamon aldehyde, one of the uh, ingredients, but it has many other very good stuff. But the smell, nice smell that we all uh, enjoy having cinnamon is because of this one, cinnamon aldehyde. We use cinnamon sticks, dip them in, in the cold salt, uh, produce nanoparticles. And these particles are well you know, homogeneously dispersed. And uh, these particles, because cinnamon has varieties of these phytochemicals, these phytochemicals created a coating on these nanoparticles. And that coating does some wonders actually. The, 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 the cinnamon phytochemical coated gold nanoparticles, when mixed with prostate tumor cells, they penetrated the prostate tumor member. You can see here hundreds of nanoparticles per cell. This is an interesting slide because if I could use just the cinnamon aldehyde, this doesn't have to come from cinnamon. This <coughs> cinnamon aldehyde is manufactured industrially. Tons of cinnamon aldehyde are manufactured every year because it is an industrial uh, you know, uh, basic chemical for, for plastic industry and whatnot. So the particles produced are just the cinnamon aldehyde. They did not have that capacity to penetrate the tumor cells. Okay, so again you can see the power of the natural resource. It is the cocktail effect that makes these nanoparticles biocompatible, that makes these nanoparticles being able to penetrate across the tumor member. If you just produce nanoparticles out of this industrial product, you would not be able to penetrate the tumor member. So again, the cocktail effect is emphasized and re-emphasized in a number of our uh, in a number of our researches that I'll show you. We, again, we got a lot of publicity there. Now, with the tea, the story gets very exciting. So when we announced this, uh, we have uh, one of the finest school of, uh, schools of journalism uh, in our country. It's perhaps uh, uh, the, the best journalism school in the world. Uh, it's ranked number one in the US. Uh, about half a dozen Hollywood actors who are acting right now. I used to say their names, so my school said that uh, we are uh, we, uh, we are not supposed to tell the name, so you can guess they're all from our day school. <laughs> Almost every TV anchor that you see on CNN, uh, CBS, ABC is from our day school. So journalism school does uh, some great things for us. And whenever they see uh, a spectacular discovery, they put out news releases. So they did that for this work. When they put out the news release, British uh, BBC picked it up and they called our discovery as uh, we discovered a cancer cure in tea. Okay, <laughs> it's not quite that, but but it, it gets pretty close to that. So what did we do? We mixed tea leaves. As our students uh, over here did yesterday, we mixed the tea leaves with gold salt, and we produced gold nanoparticles. The reason this reaction works the way it is is because, as I was telling you, it is this phytochemical that's there in tea. This is a very powerful antioxidant. It is this chemical that is once consumed, once it is in the body, it goes and scavenges those deadly free radicals that are there in our body. We generate these free radicals all the time. Okay, It is these free radicals that, that uh, damage our, our body. If the, the uh, body has excessive free radicals for whatever uh, physiologic uh, reasons, we become older very fast. So none of us would like to do that. So that's why we need to be drinking more tea. So, uh, free radical uh, scavenger does many more things. Uh, the, this particular chemical that's there in tea, not only does it transform sodium tetrachloride into gold nanoparticles, it also creates or it encapsulates itself around these gold nanoparticles, making them biocompatible, making them 
in vitro as well as in vivo robots. The oxidized form of PGCG, which is also biocompatible, that also creates a coating. It's interesting that this chemical, EGCG, as well as the oxidized form of EGCG, or FDA approved, is approved by the US Food and Drug Administration for treating cancer patients. Well, again, it's, it's kind of a misnomer. This itself is not anti tumor. Okay? Its anti tumor activity is indirect, in that it goes and grabs those two directions. So it stops cancer progression, which, which, is, which is great, actually. So, uh, uh, really exciting things about this chemical. If you count the number of hydroxy groups, there are three here, three, six, seven, eight. There are eight hydroxy groups here, which means this single chemical gives you eight minus negative charge. Okay? Eight negative charge. That means once it encapsulates, there is no way that these particles will come closer to each other because they, they are repelled away from each other because of this multiplicity of negative charges. Something, it's, it's, it's again a fairy tale that you want to produce the nanoparticles. Oftentimes, we use some other chemical <coughs> to stabilize these nanoparticles. Here, we don't need to do that. A single, as well as a simple chemical reaction, produces nanoparticles and also stabilizes them. And what is the stability? Very high Z of N shell. Particles which we had made back in 2008 is almost like a piece of exhibit that are still there in our lab and they are, they are intact. Okay, so very, very stable. And, and the reason this reaction is happening is because of the redox couple. It has a very high redox uh, potential. That's part of the reason why this can go and grab those uh, uh, free radicals uh, from the body. Uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, simple reaction, uh, mixing uh, tea leaves, EGCG, with gold salt produces burgundy red, uh, wine red, uh, gold nanoparticles of, of uh, excellent uh, homogeneity. And again, uh, the simple analysis through the plasma uh, resonance. And we do, we are able to replicate uh, this simple chemistry with, uh, with uh, the isotope of gold. Uh, a quick introduction here. Gold metal has a gold isotope, gold-198, as well as gold-199. And these isotopes have beta energy. They also have the gamma energy. <coughs> beta energy we can use for destroying human cells, human tissue, and the gamma energy can be used for imaging. Okay? Uh, we do this. Uh, most on a routine basis, we have uh, the world's largest nuclear reactor owned by any university is on our campus. So ours is a 10 megawatt reactor. It is the largest university-owned reactor. And speaking about nuclear reactors, there's nothing new for South Africa. This is uh, one of those nations where uh, nuclear reactors uh, have really marveled. You have some of the very fine nuclear reactors here in, in your country. And you produce practically every isotope that you use for medical applications here. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a great place to be talking about this, and you can replicate these things within your own nuclear reactors. So we, we make this radioactive gold salt and interacted that gold salt with, gold, uh, with, with the nanoparticle initiator, which is the EGCG, and instantly, as you can see here, we produce radioactive gold nanoparticles. By doing so, this transformation has given us a tool wherein now we, are, we, we have now particles of gold that are inherently therapeutic. I'm sure some of you who have been reading literature in nanomedicine, you, 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 you are reading that gold nanoparticles can be used as drug carriers or drug delivery systems. That's true. That's one way. But if you produce the radioactive gold nanoparticles, you don't need another drug. Radioactivity is itself a drug. All we have to do is localize these nanoparticles within the tumor site. Then you'll be able to shrink the tumor. Okay? And again, the whole process is driven through green nanotechnology. The idea here is to create or engineer these nanoparticles that suit the size of these vasculatures, that suit the size of this porosity that each of the human tumors manifest. 
and the porosity size, the diameter of the porosity as I was telling you is about 150 to 350 nanometers. And if your drug is 800 nanometers or if your drug very often, uh, which is the case, is 500 microns, there's no chance that these drugs will be able to penetrate the tumor porosity. So therefore, it's important to create these nanoparticles of sizes that can allow us to inject the drug and allow these nanoparticles to reside within the tumor site. How long? For as long as it takes to shrink the tumor. That's the whole idea here. And in science, everything we need to we need to measure, we need to experiment and see for ourselves. That's what we have done here. The metallic core of these nanoparticles from, from the EGC development, the metallic core is about 12 to 15 nanometers. And once you encapsulate them with EGC, the size goes up to about 45 to 55 nanometers out of that region. So we are within the ballpark. We can use these particles to penetrate the tumor porosity. And again, we used varieties of techniques for uh, measuring uh, the, the the size morphology, and this is not a cartoon. This is the actual picture of what happens. What happened when we incubated these nanoparticles with prostate tumor cells or human prostate tumor origin? What you are seeing here, hundreds of nanoparticles per cell. This is the picture of one cell. Hundreds of nanoparticles per cell, and each of these particles. The beauty is, they maintain their nanoparticle identity. How do we know it? Uh, there, there, there's a, a dark field microscopic instrument, uh, readily available, commercially available. We have recorded UV spectrum for each one of these particles. And we still see the carbon resonance intact. Okay, again, a very exciting development both for physicists, chemists, as well as biologists. And, and these sorts of, we call it an internalization of nanoparticles within the tumor membrane. We can use this particle for varieties of diagnostic and therapeutic varieties. And I will show you some of them. What we saw this high degree of internalization. So it's, it's always suspect with doubt. Is this just an accident? Uh, these particles going in such large numbers in which we made. So we have to doubt ourselves. If it's our result, if it looks good, the first question we had to ask is, is it real? Is it just an accident? Is it just an anecdote? So we, we have to do lots of background experiments to, to, to either prove it or disprove it, what we have. So what we did here, EGCG, we have done lots of PCR analysis. Not very popular, but, but that's the only thing we can do to, to check what kind of receptors are there on prostate tumor cells. If, if you look looked at that, prostate tumor cells exhibit varieties of protein receptors. And one of that subtype, they are called as laminin receptors. And laminin receptors are overexpressed in, in prostatic cancers, colorectal cancer, to some extent in triple negative breast cancers, as well as in pancreatic cancers. So our job here was to see the internalization of gold nanoparticles within the prostate period. Is it happening through the laminin receptors? That was the question. If it is through the laminin receptors, then we have created a tumor-specific nanoparticle. That's very, very ideal, and that's the way we would like it to be. We, we didn't want to create something that goes into the tumor just like that. That's not the kind of science anybody would like to do in the 21st century. So we tested that. But what we did was we took prostate tumor cells, incubated EGCG gold, and measured the amount of gold per cell. It's very simple uh, to do. If you have a nuclear reactor, it, it, it solves many, many problems. We, after incubating, we removed the supernatural liquid and took all those cells, which look intensely red, because all those cells have gold nanoparticles in them. And then we irradiated those cells with uh, neutrons within a nuclear reactor. By doing so, we converted the non-radioactive gold into radioactive gold almost instantly, in a few seconds. Once you know the radioactivity, you count the radioactivity, measure the radioactivity, and once you know the amount of radioactivity, you can convert that radioactivity back to the weight by simple equations. So that's how we calculate the amount of gold per cell. You can do that. Yeah, we are talking, we are talking about things in the nano domain, 
So we need to be very precise. Here we are talking about amount of code per cell, not per organ. You can do that. So after that, we what we did, we saturated those laminin receptors with laminin ligand. So for those of you with, with, uh, with, who don't have such a strong bio chemistry background, when I say saturation, we block those receptors by incubating prostate tumor cells with laminin. By blocking and then resubjecting those cells for incubation with EGCG, we should see much less uptake of gold into those cells because if you block the laminin receptors, this EGCG gold has no entry ways to enter the cells. That's what happened. We saw considerably lower amounts of gold in those cells where we had pre-blocked those laminin receptors using this laminin ligand. We measured the gold, it was considerably less compared to the unblocked cells. We did something more. We took laminin antibody, which has a much better blocking efficacy compared to laminin ligand. So with the laminin antibody, we pretty much blocked most of the laminin receptors. And when we took those cells and incubated with EGCG gold, we saw substantially lower amounts of internalization of gold into the tumor cells. Okay? So these sets of observations give us confidence that the entry of these nanoparticles into these tumor cells is indeed mediated through laminin receptors. That's important because if I want to inject these particles into the human system, I want to make sure that these nanoparticles are tumor specific. And now I have that confidence. So we have done some interesting dark field microscopic experiments just to look at those cells visually. These are the prostate tumor cells. After incubation of the EGCG, we can see every single tumor cell has threshold amount of gold in it. And when we blocked those laminin receptors and then incubated again with EGCG, we didn't see internalization of gold nanoparticles into those cells. So, and again, a nice observation that what is happening is mediated through uh, biochemical means, and it's not an accident. So basically, in, in terms of cartoons, this is what uh, is shown here. There's a metallic core decorated EGCG that allows us to target the laminin receptors. Once you target the laminin receptors, nanoparticles will get into the tumor vasculature. As they get into the tumor vasculature, our, our intention was to see if they can stick there. If they can stick there the, as long as it takes either for imaging or for therapy. And that's exactly uh, has been the outcome from these experiments. Uh, the injected dose, as you can see here, is, is sticking to the tumor site. And most importantly, it's not going to any other organ. An ideal case scenario. The, here, this is where we have injected the nanoparticles directly into the tumor. For solid tumors, you don't have to inject into the there's no, there's no need. Okay? If the intent is to control the primary tumor, once we know where the primary tumor is, inject directly there. Now, let's look at the standard of care. Standard of care with, with, uh, with the cisplatin, which is uh, currently used uh, anti-cancer agent or doxorubicin. If you injected cisplatin or doxorubicin, within 24 hours of injection, 90-95% of the injected dose migrates away from the tumor within 24 hours. What that means is the clinician has to inject again and again. That creates a toxic dose of the drug. With these nanoparticles, because of the their affinity that which we created, which we engineered to be tumor specific, because of the size that allows them to penetrate the tumor vasculature, we see that these particles reside within the tumor. 85 and 90% of the injected dose resides within the tumor really tiny amount, which is insignificant, and this amount of leakage is, 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 is unheard of with the traditional drugs. In fact, with the traditional drugs, you'll be seeing lower amounts of the drug in the tumor, maximum amounts in the non-target organs, such as liver, spleen, small intestine, and stomach, and whatnot. With the nanoparticles, we have that luxury, actually, that the, the injected dose resides within the tumor site. And this order of specificity translates into spectacular therapeutic efficacies, as shown here. 
this is the control group uh, which got only the saline or EGCG and the tumors keep growing there in the, in the control group. As you can see here, the tumors keep growing in the control group. In the experimental group, uh, just with one injected dose, uh, we are able to control the tumor or 85% of tumor volume is controlled. And the tumors did not grow until 45 days. They would not grow beyond that. We could not have let the animals continue because of the uh, protocols we have. We have to make sure that the animals uh, suffer minimum uh, discomfort, so we sacrifice the animal. But we took out the tumor tissue and look at uh, is it uh, apoptosis or uh, narcotic. So we saw a combination of both. That means that we can completely destroy the primary tumor cell. We can destroy, it to, uh, destroy and injure, uh, as we call it. We are able to injure and insert the growth factor within the tumor that the tumors will not grow. Okay, the, the tumors uh, don't grow because we even take out the stem part of the tumor by this therapy because, again, think about it. You all, all of you know that somebody is suffering from a tumor type that is resistant for radiation. Very often we, we hear these terminologies. But resistant for what kind of radiation? It's generally external beam radiation. But this is not external beam radiation. This is radiation right within the cell. Cells have no chance of survival here. You cannot penetrate, you cannot stop the cellular machinery completely by external beam radiation. Roland, how much time I have? Have I already exceeded my time? Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, want to quickly. Yeah. Take your time. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Not, not quite my time. Yeah. Uh, so where we are right now, uh, we have performed studies mice. Uh, we are doing toxicology in pigs, uh, ideal animal for toxicology. Uh, we must perform experiments in, in dog because uh, dog <coughs> is the only animal other than male human beings. Dog is the only animal that gets <coughs> prostate cancers naturally. No other animal gets it. So we must demonstrate prostate cancer efficacy in dogs before our regulatory agencies allow us to get into humans. So right now we are conducting studies in dogs, just like we treat human beings, we treat dogs. And I'll show you a series of these. Uh, uh, as the dogs are administered to our hospital, to the veterinary hospital, we measure the tumor volume by x-ray CT, and then we implant, uh, place needles, just like we would treat human patients. And then the dose is administered. Uh, Pre-administration, we know the tumor volume. Post-administration, after four weeks, the dogs come back. And as you can see here, they just uh, they have completely worked out the tumor. And I, I, just in my once, uh, one minute, I'll tell you how, how we go about doing it. We have a nationwide advertisement through our vet school that we are treating dogs owned by any owner for free. If they have their pet suffering from prostate cancer, we treat them for free because we get the data and the owners get to keep their healthy animals. We send the animals back to their home. So everybody is happy. So this is how we do it. There's no other way of doing it. You cannot create prostate tumors. If you create prostate tumors in mice, they do not mimic human prostate tumors. Prostate tumors must happen just like human beings get it. And dog is the only animal that gets it. So it's a very, very uh, you know, effective mechanism uh, that uh, gives us the data. Uh, last couple of slides. Because I have so many nanoparticles per cell, I can do very interesting uh, imaging here to detect single cells. If, if a prostate cancer patient has, uh, say, like uh, 1,500 cell cancer cells, there's no detection mechanism right now. With this technique, we can do that. We can draw the blood from human samples, and if if 10,000 uh, you know, cells are imaged using photoacoustic. If those cells don't have nanoparticles, you don't see a signal. But if I have just about 10 cells with nanoparticles in them, if you see the nanoparticles, I'll begin to see the signal. So this is the detection, uh, it's not the detection limit, we can image up to one cell. So we can do single cell detection. If these particles are specific, single pins, one day, to do both imaging and 
So with that, I would like to thank lots of people here. It's a group that uh, not only individuals in this group speak the same language. They come from chemistry background, physics background, as well production experts, neutron activation analysts, animal modeling experts, uh, oncologists, uh, you know, everybody. We need everybody. That's, that's the only way we can make progress in this field. So the, the nanotechnology, as some of you may have heard, it is also called as a disruptive science. That's because this has the power to destroy those unnecessary boundaries that have existed between different disciplines for a long time. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you again.